Dallas Cowboys rookie Damone Clark will practice on Wednesday. What does that mean for the rest of the Cowboys defense? All that and more in this episode of Locked On Cowboys Podcast. You are Locked On Cowboys, your Locked daily Dallas Cowboys on. podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Locked Network, your on. team every Locked day. On. Locked On. Locked, Locked On. Locked On Cowboys. Locked On Cowboys. Welcome back to the Locked On Cowboys podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We'd like to thank you for making us your first listen of the day. We are free and available on all platforms. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash NFL. I am Marcus Mosher. You can follow me on Twitter at Marcus underscore Mosher. He is Landon McCool. Check him out on, uh, check him out on Twitter at McCoolBCB. Landon, what's going on, sir? Not much. Uh, we're moving closer and closer to the weekend. A gig, big game this weekend against the Rams. Uh, we got questions today. I love I love questions day because it's always a, a nice little curveball in my week. Yeah, we've got a lot of questions that we're going to get to. Yeah. But before we do that, we've got some kind of breaking Cowboys news. Uh, oh. It was announced on Wednesday uh, that Damone Clark, the Cowboys' fifth-round pick, uh, linebacker from LSU, will be activated off the NFI list, meaning – He's going to start practicing this week with the hopes that he's going to play uh, relatively soon. First of all, Landon, just what are your thoughts on Damone Clark making it back from this pretty severe injury? Well, you know, the Cowboys were really in a unique situation here. First of all, they were the the, the medical staff that that identified the neck injury for Damone Clark. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and beyond that, they also had very direct and very recent experience with this situation because of – the fact that it's basically the same situation that Leighton Vander Esch had to deal mm-hmm. with. Uh, so not only did they have, were they the people, the folks that diagnosed it, not only did they have an example of, of, of how this injury in the timeline would go, they actually had a real world experience of dealing with this injury at the position that they, right. uh, that, that this player is working at. So the Cowboys had a lot of information here and information ended up being very powerful because they were able to get a steal of a linebacker in the fifth round for a guy that you, you, know, you take away this neck injury. You look just on the tape. I mean, he's a second, third round pick all day long as a linebacker. Uh, and and I'm, I'm excited to see what he does. I think the expectation for right now should probably be something like special teams to get started. I mean, we're seeing that even Jabril Cox hasn't made it onto the field yet. Uh, and he's even ahead of uh, Clark at this point as far as uh, development. But I, I do think it's exciting to see another young athletic linebacker uh, being brought into the fold for a team that, you know, wasn't hurting for speed as it was. And now they've got another guy who can kind of just get out there and run. Yeah, let's let's talk about Damone Clark, the profile really quickly, yeah. because I mean, when the Cowboys drafted him, all we really talked about was the injury. When can he get back on the field and all that kind of stuff? But in terms of just as a prospect, this was somebody who wore the number 18 at yeah. LSU, which typically goes to the player that has, you know, this is the best leader, uh, the hardest worker. We know that he's got those traits. On top of that, later, like he is an, an amazing athlete, six foot three. Uh, he is 240 pounds and he ran a, I mean, 240 pounds running a four, five, five, 40 yard dash is pretty incredible. The explosion stuff all off the charts, like, all the stuff that you you are getting from Jabril Cox, Damone Clark is bigger and somehow faster. Yeah, and, and and that's he's kind of more of the of a Mike linebacker, I would say, than than even Clark than, than yeah. uh, uh, Cox is. You know, yes. so you can easily see these guys playing on the field together. As one is the Mike and one is the Will, it'd be very clear who's who, right? Uh, but for being kind of the guy that would potentially sub in. For Leighton Vander Esch or, or Anthony Barr, he adds an extra element of speed that those those guys don't have. Uh, obviously, like I said, we got to tap the brakes on his defensive usage. I feel like it may be a ways away, but I think the fact that he's back uh, and ready to practice again uh, and that shows you the hard work ethic that this guy has. Absolutely. McCarthy talked about how he's been in there every day, like weekends included, uh, and and that's kind of the, the the vibe you get from this guy. I mean, look. That the that number eighteen honor is is a huge huge deal at LSU and, and it's and it's been given out uh, by the players and, and and by the to the folks that are 
the most um, you know representational of representative of of what LSU wants their culture to be. So to get a guy like that again in the is it sixth round that we drafted him fifth round fifth round fifth round that's just incredible and i think that you know the the fact that you only got to only had to miss out for him like on you know potentially the first half of his rookie year that's great value for the cowboys and on a, in a position that you know on a, a side of the ball that frankly the cowboys didn't necessarily need yeah. any more talent injections but they got it this is also a very experienced player. He had over 2,000 career defensive snaps at LSU. Like he just played a bunch, even in the the shortened 2020 season. But I mean, he's just on the field at all times. So I think when he is ready to, to step yeah. on the field in defense, he's not going to need a lot of snaps to get up to speed. But you mentioned special teams. Like that's where he's going to play early. I mean, you give Bones Fossil another six foot. Three two hundred and forty pound guy that can run a four or five. I, I'm sure he's just drooling right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just another big, fast guy who knows how to tackle. I mean, it, again, this defense is full of them, and and because of that, special teams is full of them. So that he's going to have to find a way to get this guy on the field. I'm sure he's uh, excited for that challenge. Yeah, it's, it's this is fun because you can see the future of the linebacker position for the Cowboys, right? Like after this year. They might move on from Leighton Van Der Esch and Anthony Barr. We'll see on Van Der Esch. I'm a little bit more optimistic that the Cowboys bring him back. But I agree. Jab- Jabril Cox, you know, still on a rookie deal. Damone Clark, a rookie. You drafted Devin Harper. You're probably going to add another linebacker next year. You still have Michael Parsons. Like You can see that the Cowboys are building a linebacker core that's super athletic, long, and you can have guys like Clark and Cox who – Excel in coverage. Like, there's a lot to be excited about uh, about when it comes to this linebacker core long term. Any thoughts on that before we move on? No, I, I think you nailed it. I mean, you know, we went from Luke Gifford being the youngest guy in this group to suddenly you've got two young, fast, athletic linebackers who come out of the SEC with a lot of experience. Hopefully, that'll kind of flatten their learning curve a little bit, and and then you know, you've got suddenly you've got a very nice linebacker core. You've got yes. veterans at the top. You've got you know an all pro all world def- defensive line hybrid linebacker that you could plug in to play linebacker sometimes. And now you've got two younger guys who can kind of come in and play the Mike and will roles uh, with a little bit more speed if you need them. Uh, and then on top of that, Luke Gifford, who's just a reliable player mm-hmm. in, 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 on we special teams Luke and Gifford, on defense. Yep. So we shouldn't forget him. No, because it's a good group. And, and I think that they've got a lot of depth now kind of throughout, which is exciting. All right, let's uh, let's get your guys' Twitter questions. But before we do that, we want to tell you about LinkedIn. As you gear up for fall, you need the right people on your team to help your small businesses fire on all cylinders, just like the Cowboys defense right now. LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find the people you want to talk to faster and for free. Create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. Then... Add your job in the purple hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring so your network can help you find the right people to hire. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on the candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. That's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster And did you know that nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn every single week? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That is linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, Lena, let's get to some questions. First one from Gorin. Given that both are playing well, who would you choose or which Brown would you choose to resign first? Noah Brown or Anthony Brown? Both players are scheduled to become free agents after the year. Interesting question. Uh, it's it's very interesting. And there's lots of parallels there because you know they both are guys that you know grew up in the Cowboys system, mm-hmm. both kind of grew into starter roles after some time, definitely being featured on special teams. Both uh, are looking for that that third contract for the Cowboys, right? Yeah. Um Man, that's tough. I, I almost think I would say Noah Brown. That's the answer uh, for me. Because I, I think the fact is you know, they have things invested at the cornerback position. They, I think you know, they're, they're clearly like Deron Bland. I think that Joseph is 
taking his time, but he's going to get there. Like, I think the special, you've seen an uptick in his special teams play. You've seen a, a level of seriousness. I think since training camp, he's really started to lock down and, and, and that's helped his cause a little bit. Hopefully by the end of the year, he's shown you a little bit, something as an outside corner. Um, you know, honestly, I, I wouldn't be opposed to re-signing both these guys if the price was right. I, I certainly right. don't don't mind having them either one of these guys on this team. Uh, I just wonder if Brown may be a little bit more affordable. And so they're both I, what, they're both named Brown, but which one? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, I got it up. Uh, Noah Brown may be a little bit more affordable uh, simply because of the position. And I think that the Cowboys don't want to necessarily have to go through the process of developing that guy again. You know, like, I mean, I think that that's the it thing is that provides they, such a good floor, right? In case yeah. Jalen Tolbert's not ready next year, you have no problem at all with Noah Brown as your third receiver. Plus, you know, all the different roles that he can do if he needs to slide back into that wide receiver role, four role. I, I, I think, I think I would be looking to give him a one year extension right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, Fahoku is, is, was really great in training camp, and I could easily see him taking that role as well. Uh, I, I honestly think that this is a, this is a great question because I do think that that there it, it's not as clear cut. I think I we came down on the side of Noah Brown, but I, I I certainly wouldn't be upset if they felt like, hey, let's 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 get Anthony Brown under mm-hmm. like a two or three year deal, uh, and and just you know give him solid but not great money, and it puts a nice floor on your pass coverage, and and I and I do like that aspect. I do love the way he operates opposite of Diggs. Yeah. I, I, so I, I think that there's value there too. It's it's tough. I would say Noah Brown, but I think it's close. Yeah, I, I would go Noah Brown, and if I was the Cowboys, I think I'd offer him like a one year, five to six million dollar extension right now. Like he hasn't really gotten paid because he was seventh round pick. Um, he didn't play enough snaps to really get a, a ton of money in free agency the first time around. I think I would give him a, a nice little pay raise. The one thing I would say with Anthony Brown is he turns 29 in December. Mm, that's a good point. And typically smaller corners don't always age that well. Now, I've got no doubts that Browns could still be good in year, you know, at age 30. But with the Cowboys obviously trying to save some money for Trevon Diggs coming up, uh, you could probably bring back Jordan Lewis on a cheap deal. You have Bland. You have Joseph. Let's not forget about Nation Wright. Yeah, who the Cowboys drafted in the third round. They just have more options there than I think they do at receiver. That's fair. Yeah, and I think you know they, but they do have options at receiver too, which is nice. Yeah. But I do think that yeah, Noah Brown seems to make a little bit more sense because the money will be cheaper, and I think you could probably convince him to do it right now. All right, next one from Chris. Uh, which one are you more surprised with how they're performing so far, Tyler Smith at left tackle, or Brett Maher at kicker? I think I, I think I saw this tweet and it, the way it was phrased at, the, I, at first, the way I read it, I thought that he was suggesting that Brett Maher was kicking Tyler. Yes, Smith. That's why I had to uh, rephrase the question. Yeah, uh, uh, great question though. Um, I, I would say, Hmm. I'm not, not surprised by Tyler Smith, honestly, because I think that we talked about it. I, I felt like it was a position that he had played before. Um, he was put, it's the timing of it and everything like that was terrible for him. But let's consider this. He's got Tyler, uh, Tyron Smith. He's got Jason Peters. He's got all these voices of guys that that are in his ear. And from what we've seen of him, he's just a, a sponge. He absorbs that stuff. So I, I think that he got put into the best case scenario for what that scenario was. So him having success with him being a talented player, not shocking. Um I think, or at least not as shocking as as a, as pulling a kicker off the street and getting a performance like that we have so far. Yeah, I mean, I mean Mars made ninety one percent of his kicks. The only one that he missed was a, was it a sixty yarder. That's the only one that he's missed so far. It's pretty great, and, and again, it, it like it kind of goes to the, the the idea that sometimes we can overreact to this stuff, guys. Like sometimes, like you know, the, the kicker drama is not as dra- dramatic as we think. Sometimes. Uh, the you know the young player being thrown into a bad situation, it's not as bad as we think. So, um, I, I I am surprised by the way Mars performed though. He's he's been fantastic. I will also say though, we've seen this across the league. Like, it, nobody thinks about the kicker position as one that you have to develop, but it's kind of the case. You look at when you use Daniel Carlson, who the the Vikings selected, I believe, in the fourth round, his first year. Awful. I think he missed three kicks on a Monday night game. 
the Vikings cut him. He goes to the Raiders, doesn't do a whole lot. Now he's the most accurate kicker in the league other than yep. Justin Tucker. I think he's made his last 24 field goals. Like this is a position where if you believe in the guys like talent and they've got the right, you know, kind of they're in the right mental headspace, they can get better even if they struggle a little bit earlier in the career. I, I see. I don't. I 100% agree with you, but where I don't agree is that I don't think this is development. I just think kickers, in general, all of them are streaky. They all some, are, yes, they, yes. They, 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 they have a streak where they're kicking and they're feeling it. Their, their process is great. They get with a, a snapper and a holder that they're comfortable with, and, and, and the, the process is just second nature to them. And then one day they sleep in a bed wrong. Or they, you Which know, is what happened get, to Dan Bailey, right? They get the yips, uh, or they, you know, they just can't stop pushing the ball. They can't stop uh, slicing it, it, and they can't adjust. And they, then they're trying to chase the dragon on it, and they're like, mm-hmm. "Oh, maybe if I change my." It, it's, I mean, anybody who's played golf knows the 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 thing I'm describing here, yes. right? The kind of constant tinkering to get back to what was natural. Uh-huh. That, was, that was natural, right? And Marcus has got a real big smile on his face here. Uh, I, I, so I think that was you know, way that... too often with me, and I golf <laughs> not every day. So, uh, I, I mean, every time I hit a golf ball, it just goes straight that way. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I think that that's what happens with kickers. You know, I, I think that there's a couple of good ones that will go on extraordinarily long streaks. They'll, they'll, they'll be within themselves, and they won't let distractions get to them, and they just are very zen about it and they can get with like i said a a a a a group that they are comfortable with the snap the the operation is clean uh but then you know it just seems like eventually they're going to hit a snag whether it's you know it, all these guys do it so i'm surprised because that that it came the way it did uh simply because mar has you know been very mm-hmm. bad and very good at different times but you know, that's just the way kickers are, to be honest. Like, it's just a very streaky position. Yep. It's it's one that I don't know how to figure out. Like, I just, that's the one position that's really hard to figure out which guys are good and which guys are bad and who's going to stay good and who's going to all of a sudden fall off the cliff. But as of right now, Brett Mars performing really well. Knock on wood. He uh, he continues to do that. Uh, let's, let's get to some more questions. Um, this one from John. Has Deron Bland, the Cowboys' rookie corner, climbed ahead of Calvin Joseph and Nashon right on the depth chart? I think they play different spots. You know, I think Nashon is Nashon and Kelvin are specifically outside corners as, as it is right now. Uh, if if you're getting Kelvin Johnson, uh, Kelvin uh, Joseph jo- Joseph on the field, uh, you're you're kicking Brown inside to play nickel, and he's playing so. on the outside. So, um, I, yeah, I mean, I think in the sense that. They're higher on the depth chart because, I mean, they're playing right now. Yes, they have, but I don't know that they are. They they play different spots, you know. So it's it's hard to like compare I, I, apples. Or I don't stuff. know. Like, let's say the Cowboys are stacking their roster, right? And they're like ranking the players. Like, hey, yeah. Trevon Diggs is our best corner. Anthony Brown's our second best corner. Corner. I don't know if Bland is ahead of Joseph or not. Yeah. Um. But the fact that we're having this conversation is noteworthy, right? Like Deron Bland, a late day three pick, playing snaps at least now ahead of Calvin Joseph, goes to show you that I think they how, like the Fresno State kid quite a bit. How about this? I, I will say that I think they are more comfortable with Bland playing in the slot than Joseph playing outside right now. And I think I think they certainly like Bland right now a whole lot more than they like Nation Wright. Yeah, I think that's fair. You know, I, I think Bland has shown something in games. That, I mean, interception was fantastic. Mm-hmm. It's shown something in a game that that that's and that's more than what you could say for right at this point. Yeah, uh, I can't, I don't know how you can't be excited about Deron Bland. All he did was make plays in the preseason, and then when he's forced into action because of, of an injury, what does he do? He creates an interception. I it's, I don't know. There's just a I, lot I, to be excited about with him. I still can't get over that he wasn't drafted higher. I remember when he got drafted, we hadn't really watched him. And then we mm-hmm. go and watch him and he's like, he has incredible man coverage skills, even in college, you know? Yep. And, I, and I guess it was because he was at Fresno state, but I, I don't know. Like he's, he's a player. It, it, yeah. The Cowboys really got one there for sure. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's get to some more questions. But before we do that, we want to tell you about bet online, BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your football betting info this season. Find all the latest, latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth articles and analysis 
on every game that you can find. And as always, Bet Online remains your continued source for all of your sports wagering information with live betting and up to the minute scores for every sport out there. It is the fastest and the easiest way to check in on all of your favorite games and events, including the NFL, NBA, MLB, MMA, boxing, and golf. You guys know all the sports. You're good there. Head to betonline.net or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. All right, let's uh, let's buzz through some more of these questions. This one from Sam: Are there any free agent additions or potential trades out there that you think Dallas could make that would take this team to the next level? I mean, you know, the state of the roster is not terrible as it stands I, right now. I you think know? You, like, you keep your powder dry at right now, right? Yeah. Like. We keep saying this. There are going to be other injuries that happen that they maybe don't have the depth that that's when you need to go out and make a trade. I just don't think they're in a position right now where they have to add anybody. They're three and one with their backup quarterback, man. Yeah. Like they've got talent on this team and depth. You don't do that without, without having talent and depth. So I think for right now, let's see what this team looks like when Dak gets back and, I mean, maybe we can evaluate there, but I mean, I have a feeling that just by the experience that this team is getting this through this whole first month of the season without Dak, when Dak comes back and and, and the offense kind of gets in sync, they kind of change the percentages on these third downs. This is going to be a tough team to beat. I, I will say the one position that I think they could add somebody to and really improve at would be at defensive tackle, right? I mean, I, I I really like what Osa is doing. I think Neville Gallimore is a nice rotational player. Tristan Hill has been a little bit up and down, but if you could get like a superstar guy there that could occupy double teams, that can win in one-on-one situations, I don't know who that guy is. Like, I don't think, I don't think the Giants are trading Dexter Lawrence. I don't think the Jets are training Quinn and Williams, but somebody like that could really help this defense. But again, there's only five or six of those guys in the league right now. I don't think teams are going to be all that anxious to give them up. Yeah. And I think honestly, if you want to just wait a little while, there's a good chance that Oso Digizua turns into one of those guys. Cause yeah. he is just this guy, like his game has really been fantastic these last few weeks and it's gone unnoticed in a lot of spots, but he's even taken on double teams and, and, and doing a lot of the stuff that you're not necessarily expecting him to do. Um, so yeah, I do agree that I think that that's one spot where maybe you could add a topper. But those yeah. players are very rare, and they're hard to pry away from the teams that they're on. Uh, so I, I don't anticipate it. No, I, I don't anticipate that happening. That's that's just the one spot that I would be kind yeah. of sniffing around, but I don't think that's going to happen. This one from Mike. How wrong were the criticisms of this team's chances after Amari Cooper, Lyle Collins, uh, Cedric Wilson, Connor Williams, and Gregory were allowed to leave, and guys like Bobby Wagner and Von Miller were not signed? I, I mean, it depends on who you're asking. I mean, I I wasn't wrong. Um, I, you know, look, I, look. I, I was. Uh, go ahead. We all tend we all tend to be you know hyperbolic about uh, you know not getting what we want or not thinking that the Cowboys are doing what we think that they should be doing at different times. And there's plenty of opportunity for all of us to be wrong at different points during the season. I, I think that the, the the main thing is that. You know, like there, just in a general sense, I, I, I have a hard time arguing against the idea of letting your young talent grow and and have an opportunity to take the place of some older veterans. What? Well, because it, I, it just seems like say, that's been a very winning situation, and every time we've complained about it, it feels like it it, it ends up okay. I would also say it depends on the player. Like we could go through these. Like I understood why the Cowboys moved on from Lyle Collins, right? He just, he was getting to the point where he was getting banged up more and more. You like what you saw from Terrence Steele and you were able to save 10 million. Uh, Now I'm surprised that Terrence Steele is playing as well as he did, but that one at least made some sense to me. The Connor Williams one, you and I were indifferent on because we thought Connor Williams was a little bit better than what the, national Cowboy perception was, was. Yeah, yeah. and you can see that this year like the left guard spot's been a problem for the cowboys and it would be nice to have somebody like connor williams in there but the one to me that i still don't think makes sense and i, mm. I think you agree is the randy gregory one right oh i will we 
the Cowboys wanted Randy Gregory back. Let's yeah, let's that's just be that's clear that's about the that. thing to remember. There is that is that you know the Gregory situation is different than the rest of those because yes. that wasn't planned necessarily. So go ahead, continue. I say that's the one where the Cowboys wanted him to get to come back, and you're seeing why. Like I know he got banged up and he's on the injured reserve list now, but he was leading the NFL in pressures through four weeks. When you have him, the Marcus Lawrence and Michael Parsons on the same defense, you have the best pass rush in the NFL. That's the only one that bothers me a little bit after four games. But again, that one we were wrong about or whoever was wrong about it, but it still proved the same point to me in the same, in some ways, not that they necessarily served youth, but the fact is, is that they were able to take Randy's money, give it to two or three other guys. And, and look, those two or three other guys have not necessarily amounted to Randy Gregory, but am I going to be able to, which one of those situations, the single 29-year-old Randy Gregory, who is now dealing with a second knee injury on his opposite knee from the one that he had the knee surgery on previously, or two players in Dorrance Armstrong and Dante Fowler that, you know, if one of them goes down, you still have the other one. To me, I can understand the thought process of it might be, you might be getting more production, more over the length of the season with those two players operating in their roles than Randy Gregory operating in his role. You know, when you account for injuries, you account for lost time, whatever. I, I, I th- tend to think, would I rather have Randy Gregory? Yes. That's let me be clear. It's I'm just, not, saying, it's not as maybe dire as it looked. Yes. In May. Like that's the thing. All of these are not, I guess that's my point here. And that's always been my point is that none of this is cut and dry. None of this is as clear as it's being made out. Even the Amari Cooper situation, right? Like, I mean, Amari Cooper has drawn a lot of coverage. He's definitely helped that Cleveland passing, but 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 his, ultimately his production is extremely similar to what Noah Browns has been, right? And and it's not all about production. Obviously, like the way that you affect the defense has more value than necessarily sure. some of your production. But but at the end of the day, like. Is, does it make more sense to pay your your third targeted, your second wide receiver $20 million when you can get similar production, do what you want to do with your wide receiver one uh, for $19 million less a year? I think that makes that that doesn't make no sense. You know, it's it's not like it's completely out of out of the question. I think the thing that people get hung up on is stuff is is the trade or the way it went down. And I think the same thing applies to Randy, right? Like the way it went down is what was so upsetting for all of us. Like, especially for, for someone like me, I, I've been a Randy Gregory fan since the beginning. I've, I've been a defender of him since when no one would defend him. And and for it to all go down the way it did and, and for them to go through the negotiations and go through the back and forth of all that and then it turn around to be a situation where he walks away from the table at the last minute and the Cowboys kind of get screwed. Like, that was an incredibly tough pill to swallow. Um, and we've all had to just see how that played out. And and so far it's, you know, you can certainly see it both ways, but it hasn't killed the Cowboys yet. Definitely hasn't killed the Cowboys. Uh, Cowboys sitting in a good spot, three and one. They've got a lot of talent and depth on this team right now. Uh, Hindsight's always 20, 20. I want want you to remember that, but so far I don't think we can criticize them too, too much for allowing guys like Lyle Collins and Amari Cooper and Cedric Wilson and Connor Williams uh, to leave this off season. All right, that is it for today's show. We'd like to thank you guys for making Locked on Cowboys your first listen every day. Now make your second listen to Peacock and Williamson NFL show. Brian Peacock and former NFL scout Matt Williamson give you the expert NFL analysis in less than 30 minutes. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. I just want to let you know tomorrow we'll have the the Locked on Crossover podcast with Locked on Rams. It's a lot, a lot of fun getting ready for that game. And then Landon and I will be back on Friday to get you ready for this big week five contest. So make sure you're downloading, subscribing to the podcast, wherever you would get your podcast. Check us out over on YouTube. Follow Landon at McCoolBCB. I am at Marcus underscore Mosier. And we'll see you guys next time.